One of the most highly praised episodes of the original Star Trek series is City on the Edge of Forever, written by Harlan Ellison. It is also one of the most controversial episodes, not because of the content, but because Harlan Ellison famously disowned Gene Roddenberry's treatment of his script. When the episode won a Hugo, Ellison dedicated the award to the memory of the script they butchered. But I don't want to rehash all that drama because... I am Daisy X Machina, the dry queen detective who investigates all things speculative in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. What I want to do is compare the Gene Roddenberry episode that aired with the graphic novel version because Ellison said this is the version that was the city on the edge of forever out of my imagination. Several people in the comments of my last Harlan Ellison video mentioned this graphic novel, so I want to see for myself. By the way, I'm always up for a conversation, so please let me know your thoughts down in the comments. And while you're there, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my Chanel. Okay, so first I had to get a copy of the graphic novel, which is made up of five issues of the comic published by IDW. The story was adapted to graphic novel format by Scott and David Tipton, artwork by J.K. Woodward. I finally found a copy on the Oxford Comics and Games website, which cost me about $30 with shipping. Let me know if I got ripped off or not. I have no idea. If you want to purchase the original comics, you'll obviously be paying through the nose. I should say the graphic novel is gorgeous. The artwork really captures the original series, I think. I have nothing but praise for the artist and artwork. Since the graphic novel is made up of five issues, I'm going to compare and contrast each issue with the relative corresponding scenes in the original episode. In issue one, we open with a drug deal. A crew member named Beckwith is selling jewels, or jewels of sound. They kind of look like the Venus drugs that Harry Mudd sold, and like those drugs, they are addictive and illegal. Do they even use money in Star Trek? Maybe he sells them for gold-pressed latinum? I don't know. Beckwith sells the drugs to an addict who is stationed on the bridge, and the addict has some sort of bad trip and freaks out and almost disables the Enterprise. Racked by guilt, he decides to blow the whistle on Beckwith, but for some reason warns Beckwith that he's going to do that. Beckwith has to stop the addict, so he kills him. Uhura witnesses the murder, and Beckwith has to run away. He teleports to the planet that the Enterprise is currently investigating because it is surrounded by some sort of mysterious radiation. By the way, I read somewhere that Ellison at one point wanted Scotty to be the drug dealer. Scotty? Okay, so a lot happens just to set up having a bad guy teleport to a mysterious planet. In the original television episode, we have no drug dealer. Instead, we have McCoy accidentally getting injected by a compound that makes him insane, and then he runs off and teleports to the mysterious planet. All this takes place under the five-minute mark in the episode. So question, would it have been possible to establish the drug dealer, the bad trip, the murder, the witness to murder, and then teleporting to the planet in five minutes? Maybe. It just feels like a lot was happening. The other question is the need for Beckworth. I think Ellison wanted a bad guy, a guy who you really wanted to hate. In the episode that aired, McCoy obviously is not a bad guy. He just got unlucky and isn't in his right mind, so there are more 
shades of gray. Which do you prefer? Okay, that's half of the first issue of the comic. The next half is Kirk, Spock, Yeoman Rand, and six red shirts beaming down to the mysterious planet. They see a crystal city in the mountains that apparently has been abandoned. Yes, it is the city on the edge of forever. On the side of the mountain are these tall beings. I guess they're projections or something. They're apparently what's left of a race that used to live in the city aeons ago. They're 20 feet high and look like old white men. Actually, they kind of look like Gandalf. They explain that they are the guardians of time, and Kirk asks to see the history of Earth, and they go back to the dinosaurs. Then Kirk asks to hold the viewing of the history when it gets to the 1930s because he's fascinated by that time period. He wants to know if he can travel back to the 1930s, and the guardians say yes, but warn that's very dangerous because he could change the timeline. That's when Beckwith appears and jumps through the portal. And that's where the issue ends. In the television episode, first we get Uhura instead of Janice Rand in the landing party. We also get Scotty. And there's only two red shirts. Now there's no city. There are runes, R-U-I-N-S. And Allison says he wrote runes, R-U-N-E-S, and some knucklehead didn't know the difference. (laughs) These runes extend to the horizon. But there's no actual city, but we can guess these are the runes of the city on the edge of forever. Instead of a bunch of Gandalfs, we get a talking gateway that shows them Earth's past. They find McCoy and have this idea to go back one day in time to avoid McCoy getting that accidental drug overdose. Spock freaks out that he hasn't been recording the history and then starts recording it. And then McCoy breaks away and jumps through the portal. And this is about the 10 minute mark. The second issue of the comic or part two of the graphic novel opens with the Guardians being pissed off that time was changed. The landing party doesn't know what's going on. And there's a whole scene where they get beamed up to some sort of space pirate ship called the Condor. And why is the Condor orbiting this planet? It's never really explained, but there's this big fight, and they eventually escape and beam back down to the planet. The Guardians say that Beckwith is evil and needs to be stopped because time is broken. They agree for Kirk and Spock to go back and give some cryptic warnings or prophecies. He will seek that which must die and give it life. Stop him. And blue it will be, blue as the sky of old earth, and clear as the truth, and the sun will burn on it, and there is the key. So Kirk and Spock jump through the portal and time travel to the 1930s, specifically, very specifically, before Beckwith arrives. The television episode is a lot different. The Guardian doesn't seem to care that the past was changed. He's like, oh well, them's the breaks. Instead of a big scene with space pirates, the Enterprise is just gone. Captain, I've lost contact with the ship. I was talking to them. Suddenly it went dead. Nothing. I think that's a lot spookier, especially because Uhura is so shook. Captain, I'm frightened. Kirk and Spock decide to try to go back and stop McCoy from doing whatever he did to change time, though they don't have any idea what it could be, and this Guardian doesn't give any prophecies. They tell the rest of the landing party, if they fail, that they each in turn have to make the attempt. For me, it feels as though the stakes are a lot higher. By the way, we're at the 14 minute mark, about a fourth of the way through the episode. The second part of the graphic novel continues with Kirk and Spock arriving in 1930s New York. They immediately get set upon by a race of bigots because they think Spock is Chinese, calling him a coolie. 
they're rioting because it's the Depression and there's this nationalistic fervor that foreigners are taking their jobs. So anyway, Kirk and Spock run away and hide from the mob. And that ends the second comic. In the television series, there's no mobs or bigots. Everyone stares at them because they look so different. And then they try to steal some clothes and they get caught by a policeman. And there's a bit of comedy relief when Kirk tries to explain why Spock has pointed ears, saying he's Chinese and got his head caught in a mechanical rice picker. I thought it was funny. Anyway, we're at the 17-minute mark. In the third comic, or third part of the graphic novel, Kirk and Spock hide out in a basement of some tenement building where they conveniently find clothes. The building's owner turns out to be a nice guy who gives them some work, no questions asked, proving not everyone is a bigot and some people actually have a kind heart. They try to use a tricorder to figure out when history changed. Spock gets a job as a dishwasher where there's another bigot and calls him the Yellow Peril. There's lots of social commentary on racism in the Ellison version. Spock then sees Edith Keeler, who is wearing a blue cape, blue like the sky, and has a brooch like the sun, and immediately figures out she is the one who the Guardians told them to look out for. He tells Kirk, and Kirk immediately hits on her, and she agrees to go on a date with him. So, yeah, that's the end of the third part of the graphic novel. In the television series, Kirk and Spock also go into a basement, but instead of a random nice guy who is the owner and befriends them, it is Edith Keeler. Kirk is immediately attracted to her. You can tell by the music track. Besides, this is Joan Collins in her prime. She is gorgeous. Spock's tricorder holds a recording of what the Guardian of Time had showed them, but it's having trouble getting it to function. So Kirk uses some good old reverse psychology to get him to build some sort of device to enhance it, which is another little comedy relief moment. Edith Keeler takes pity on them and hires them at 10 hours a day, 15 cents an hour. Here we're at the 20 minute mark. One thing about Ellison's treatment is he threw in lots of extraneous characters like the drug dealer, the addict, six red shirts, a whole crew aboard the Condor, and so on, without really taking into account that Star Trek had to work on a budget and couldn't just hire all these extra actors. But even putting that aside, I think the story is a little tighter with Edith Keeler as the building owner rather than some random nice guy. Okay, anyway, we're now on the fourth part of the graphic novel. We open with a montage of Edith and Kirk falling in love. Then there's a scene in her apartment where it kind of looks like they're living together. Anyway, Kirk is really sad. There's a flashback with a conversation with Spock, who reveals that Edith Keeler must die. He learned that from the tricorder. Kirk tries to deny it, but can't really argue with Spock's logic. The television show is pretty similar, but we get more reason why Edith has to die. She's a visionary, and she predicts things like atomic energy and spaceships, which really felt dissonant for a speech in a soup kitchen. There's lots of banter and flirting to build up the relationship between Kirk and Edith Keeler. And Spock uses a tricorder to see that there are two futures, one where she dies and one where she lives, but it's uncertain which one needs to happen. And we're at the 33 minute mark now. In the last half of part four of the graphic novel, There's more scenes of Kirk and Edith's relationship, but then there is a really dark scene where Kirk finds Spock's phaser and realizes he means to kill Edith Keeler himself. Then we cut to Spock walking around with his phaser and Beckwith suddenly appears and tries to shoot him. That's the end of part four. We finally have Beckwith back in the story. In the television series, 
McCoy arrives raving like a lunatic and scares a homeless man. And here we're at the 35-minute mark. In part five of the graphic novel, the fifth and last comic in the series, we open with a homeless man who is drawn to look like Harlan Ellison. That is a special and really cool thing the artist did for Ellison, who has a touching little note at the back of the book about how moved he was to find himself in this comic. Anyway, the homeless man is a veteran of Verdun, a famous battle in World War I. He agrees to keep a lookout for Beckwith. There's another bittersweet scene between Edith and Kirk. Then we cut back to the homeless man telling Kirk and Spock that he thinks he's seen Beckwith. They track Beckwith down. There's a fight scene and Beckwith almost kills Kirk. But the homeless man throws himself in front of Kirk, sacrifices himself to let Kirk live. In the television show, McCoy is still insane but passes out and a homeless man steals his phaser and accidentally kills himself. I think it's pretty obvious that the graphic novel had a much more powerful scene with the homeless man. The graphic novel ends with Beckwith trying to save Edith Keeler's life, but then Kirk having to stop him. The timeline is returned to normal, and they go back to the Guardians of Time. Beckwith tries to escape again, but instead of going to the past, he gets trapped in the heart of a burning sun, a punishment apparently that's going to go on forever. Kirk and Spock are back on the Enterprise having a long conversation about loss and love and good and evil. Then we end with a shot of Kirk screaming out of a window in the Enterprise. The television show ends with Edith nursing McCoy, who is no longer insane but still doubts his sanity since he has No idea how he got to be in 1930s USA. When he finally meets Kirk and Spock, Edith starts walking across the street, and Kirk stops McCoy from saving her, and the timeline is back. McCoy yells that he could have saved her, and Spock says he knows. Kirk is devastated, but the timeline is fixed. The Guardian offers more trips to the past, but Kirk says, let's get the hell out of here. So which one is better, the televised version or the graphic novel version? Now, I had heard so much about how awesome the original Ellison version was. My expectations may have been way too high. There were things I liked a lot better in the television show. This may be controversial, but I preferred the amoral computer-like guardian in the TV show as opposed to the spirits of Gandalf that appeared on the side of a mountain. I also liked that there were more comedy relief moments in the TV show, like trying to pretend Spock's ears were caught in a rice picker, or when Spock says he only needs five or six pounds of platinum to fix his machine. I also actually preferred the landing crew completely stranded when the Enterprise simply disappears. I don't think the pirate ship added anything. I could have done without showing how awful bigots were to Asians in the 20s. The bigger question, though, I guess, is whether it could have been made to fit a 50-minute program. The graphic novel felt like it packed way more scenes than could have been crammed into one episode. Even if Star Trek had the budget for all the extra sets and actors that would have been required, there were more emotional gut punches in the graphic novel, which I think may be why many people prefer Ellison's original, like the beggar who was a World War I veteran giving his life to save Kirk, and the drawn-out melodrama of Kirk having to let Edith Keeler die. That said... There were a lot of talking head scenes between Kirk and Spock, which I'm not sure would work as well in a TV show as it does in printed form. My guess is that Ellison didn't want to let go of the major plot arc of the evil drug dealer. He had a moment of redemption when he tries to save Edith Keeler, but then Kirk, who really was in love with Edith, had to stop him so she could die. 
It felt more tragic than the television version, especially since you didn't expect an act of kindness from the evil drug dealer. I don't know. I kind of prefer Gene Roddenberry's version as a Star Trek episode, but I like the Ellison version as a graphic novel, which maybe means the original story wasn't a great fit for the medium of a televised one-hour science fiction drama. I really want to know what you think down in the comments. Until we meet again, may all the books you read be...